Hi, welcome to our Sanctuar workshop. Um, I'm Carolyn Hall. I am an historical marine ecologist, a dancer and performer, and also I teach science communications. And I'm Clarinda Macklow, and I have been a microbiologist, but I'm also uh, someone who's worked in performance, and I also create experimental institutions, and I think a lot about how we exist in the world in relationship to each other through imagination. Yeah, so we both are very focused on figuring out how to communicate science and data to the public in a way that uses our, not only our scientific backgrounds, but our artistic backgrounds. How do we engage the public on a deeper level by using both? And um, before we go any further, I wanna thank Patricia Kim for inviting us to participate in this conference. Um, she has a talk on this platform as well. She's been doing some really cool work with a group of people on humanizing data. So please check out her talk too. Um, and we're going to tell you a little bit about Sunk Shore, our project. Clarinda, while I'm finding my screen, can you take over? Yes. So, so uh, Sunk Shore was a project we began because we were thinking a lot about how difficult it is to understand um, the immensity of climate change, climate crisis, and how data, especially, well, there's quite a, quite a plethora of data, but how can you actually bring that into yourself? How can you, as an individual, understand it? And so we um, devised kind of a methodology for creating an experience that would help people gain access to that data in a more visceral and personal way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so we have done a number of tours uh, in New York City. The one we're gonna be showing you pictures from is on Governor's Island, which is right in the middle of New York Harbor between Brooklyn and Manhattan. And in these ways to embody data and make uh, climate change data more accessible and relatable, we have sort of, five key ways we do that. Um, this first picture is to show that we are always very site specific and working from local knowledge. This is literally on the waterfront of Governor's Island and you can see uh, the tip of Manhattan there. That's the new uh, One World Trade Center, um, the Freedom Tower. And that no local knowledge and site specificity is very important for being familiar with the place and understanding. Because, yeah, go ahead. Well, just because what we're doing is what we call it is a, a tour of the climate change future. So when we say we give, we're giving a tour, people think of something often theatrical or kind of um, based in a theater, but kind of envisioning, but it's actually the opposite where we want to place people in a sense of being absolutely actually in the future so rather than saying it will be, we always say it is. So we take people on a time travel, basically on a time travel through what this shoreline, this specific location, what will happen in the future based into a deep in the deep dive into the climate change data. Um, but again, it's not like, well, this will, it's like, okay, you have to be in the place in the future. And so everything that we do and all these principles that we're gonna tell you are to create the sense of actually being there. Mm -hmm. Being there through time, being there through your senses and being there experiencing it, whether it's past, present or future at that moment. So we also are very much into making that data physical, tangible, felt. Um, Clorinda, do you want to talk about this one? Yeah, so this is, um, we are in boats. And basically along the edge of Governor's Island, there's a walkway. And because of, you know, what sea level rise will, will do, we have made that now into a canal. So we're in 2050 and our participants are 
now in boats. So we're all in boats and those uh, multi-purpose tools you see are serving as oars. So this is a way of kind of getting people, it's silly, it's obviously not an actual boat, but it's a way of in, engaging imagination and also creating a physical um, like togetherness also. So we're all in the boat. I mean, it's, it's a little on the nose, but we're all in the boat together. It takes all of us to move the boat forward. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so that's, but, it, but it's also fun. And that's actually a, a really important component because the future is not actually looking so fun. So allowing people some levity while we are actually imparting fairly dire information. <laughs> Right. And putting them in that environment. And speaking of um, envisioning or imagination, we also do a lot of leading through um, prompts, through sensory prompts. In this picture, um, our participants are lined up facing Manhattan along the waterfront and their eyes are actually closed because we're starting with the past. So in order for them to go backwards in their mind, they were just looking at Manhattan and that water line. And we're asking them to, to think through their senses in terms of what they're hearing, what they're smelling, what they're feeling under their feet. And we're giving them historical data, historical facts about what that place was when. So they yeah. are using their minds to go back in time. All of these things are to, again, give you a sense of place and actually situate you in the actual location. Mm -hmm. And you've seen a couple examples of this, but we also use pretty basic props that we make. But the, but, and so these, Clorinda will tell you about, these are our weight oars. But the props actually, again, put you physically, tangibly, in connection with the data that we're talking about that, these, that require these props. Do you want to tell them about weight oars? Um, so these are wetness, wet, wait, wet adaptive dryness sensors. So that's um, a way for, because we were saying, well, here we are in 2050 and the, these, uh, your feet are always gonna be wet and dry, wet and dry because you never know when it's gonna be a storm. So we have developed these weight oars, which you wear and which go from wet to dry really easily. So it's obviously just a suggestion, but it's also, like uh wake up like oh right this affects your body you know and it's going to affect your shoes <laughs> so something fairly basic right i mean and it's protective gear which we're all dealing with right now during our yes. global pandemic of having to having to adapt to a new environment so this is a this is again sort of a fun suggestion of how one might have to adapt in a future um, and finally, we have our, we talk about, we have a narrative to take people through this. Clarinda talked about this in the beginning in the sense that we are really involving people in a story of this changing shoreline, of this location, and um, the speculative fiction that takes us into the future of what this place might look like and might require. And this one, Clarinda. So... So it's, it's a fiction, obviously. Everything we're saying is based in data, but um, in this one, we're going through the portal from 2050 to 2100. Mm -hmm. And because 2100 will be quite aquatic, especially in light of uh, sea level rise on Governor's Island, um, there is, we, we help people adapt to being more fish-like. So in this one, uh, Carolyn has given people a lot of different um, ways of being more, more like fish, like seeing from side to side, using the sides of your body to sense things. And people are making their way through the portal as fish. And the multipurpose tool has now become a fin, for example. But again, this is, this is obviously fiction. This is more obviously fiction than some of the other things we do. And because we do everything quite pretty straightforward, sometimes people think we're basically telling a truth. 
and we have to remind them at the end, like, we just made it up, you know, we made it up from our local knowledge. So what we do obviously is very embodied and experiential and we would like to lead you through a brief experiential score to um to give you a sense of of how this uh data embodiment can can work so uh i'll, I'll lead us through and clarinda will um demonstrate but there will be a lot of closed eyes so clarinda will give you um examples as we go um so you can do this standing or sitting and why don't you go ahead and close your eyes and i want you to think about a shoreline or a water body that you know that you're familiar with it can be from your childhood or it can be from now but one that you have knowledge about one that you have experience with and i'm going to i'm going to be quiet now for 10 seconds so you can really put that water body that shoreline and really put yourself there really bring it into your mind okay now i want you to turn to face you can open your eyes to do this i want you to turn to face the direction of where that water body or shoreline is in the world. So I'm turning east because my water body and shoreline are the East River. Okay. And once you've turned to face your water, um, close your eyes again. And we're going to go into really bringing uh, the senses of that of you, your senses, and bringing to life that water body through those senses. So what does it sound like around this shoreline or body of water? What does the air smell like? Do you hear people or birds or boats, construction? What is the surrounding environment like? Is it more wild and natural or is it very urban or something in between? How does the light feel? How does the air feel on your skin? And if you've been in this water, what's the temperature of the water? Have you tasted this water? Is it salty or fresh? And also how does the water move? Is it very still or are there big waves? If you've been in the water and you felt it move against you, how did it make you move? I'm going to be quiet for 10 seconds and let you really bring your senses and your sensory experience to this place. Okay, so you can open your eyes and we will all come back together. So one reason we wanted to do this is because a shoreline is a specific place and we all have a shoreline. Even if you're in the desert, you have a shoreline. And even if you don't have a shoreline, you used to have a shoreline. So there, the, our relationship as human bodies to our water bodies is always present. Um, so it's a way of focusing and thinking specifically about, again, about this data, how it will affect all water bodies in one way or another. So you can, if, if you're near your place or even not near your place, you can think about applying the data we know and the ways we think about information to a specific place. So for me, I'm in New York City, I'm in Manhattan, and I've lived near the East River for most of my life in one way or another, and I currently live near the East River. So um, that's my shoreline. And 
it has many effects on my life. Like I remember when it was an industrial waterfront. I'm old enough to remember that. I remember when it was abandoned. I remember Hurricane Sandy when it kind of came up over its banks and entered my home. Um, so these, th this is all, and I know what's going to happen in the future. They're planning to bury the waterfront park in a, in a berm. So there's all these different ways that how we think about waterfront translates into how we think about the future related to the ways that the climate is bound to change or already has changed. So for example, Sandy was something I had never seen in, in decades, right, of knowing this body of water. And that is a direct effect of shifting climate. So I felt it in my body, I really did, right? Because there was water in my building. Um, and I also understood it as a function of something larger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, and so like Clorinda has these specific stories related to this very familiar water body that she actually has a ton of local knowledge about. Right, she knows the site, she knows its history, she knows its present, and she also knows plans for the future. And that's, that's the narrative part of this. You create an arc through time, a past, present, and future, which is what we do with Sunk Shore, and is what um, you can do with your known body of water, your known shoreline. So just to go through this exploration of this local knowledge and this arc. So, what the present time is where we are now. We're in this COVID-19 global pause. And um, perhaps you cannot even get to your shoreline or water body you're thinking about now. Have you been able to access it? That's in the present, that's right now. What we just envisioned had to do with your previous knowledge as well about your history, your, what you knew before this crisis, your experience before we've all been staying at home. And then the next questions are the near future and the further future. The near future is what will be the status of this or the, what shape will your water body or shoreline be in when COVID-19 and the coronavirus current crisis resolves? That would be an immediate, hopefully immediate future. A further future is what changes may occur to your shoreline or your water body as climate change continues. So these are ways to think about the narrative and the story of if you were to do like a sunk shore what, that we do with the waters around New York City, with, if you were going to do that with your body of water or your shoreline. And we find, we think this is important because everybody has their own and we're not going to be able to tell everybody about their own but we all, need, we all need to know about it. And, and it's a thing that we are in something that's very hard, like we're in two, we're now in two crises that are very hard to hold in our heads, right? One is the climate change crisis. The other is a global pandemic. And both of those have, are, are so large that it's really hard to hold them in our body. But you it like they are related because because of this huge nature because of the danger they pose the way that we endanger each other one is a little more immediate um having an infectious disease passing an infectious disease it's a little more clear but because a virus is invisible in the, in because it's so small in the way that uh the global climate crisis is hard to envision because it's so big, um, sometimes it's hard to keep it in your body, to keep the knowledge embodied and really real. And we see the same kinds of denial and we just see the same kinds of fear. And, and more importantly, or very importantly, the same vulnerable people are vulnerable to both these crises. So the more we understand not only that it's real, that's pretty important, but also that 
there are ways to be personally present with this. So I'm staying home. That's I'm able to do that. That's being personally present with this current crisis and thinking about your water, your shoreline and your responsibility towards that water and that shoreline is a way to be personally present with a climate crisis. And the way and the, telling these personal stories about what you know, your experience, perhaps in this pandemic or your experience of a particular shoreline that you have watched over time. These take it from being the data about either the virus or climate change from being abstract and numbers and overwhelming amounts of information to making it a very relatable focused experience. And actually there's a, there's a really interesting um, app that was developed in London that was trying to get to some of the information about the virus that wasn't as publicly acknowledged. They created an app for local people in England to just upload any of their experiences on, in terms of um, what symptoms they were feeling or if they were well or what severity, and they would load those all into the app and it didn't matter if they'd had a test because in, in England as in the United States, the tests have not been so available for everyone. So this was to try to get around that, to get a better assessment of who was being affected and how. And one of the things that came out of that was that 60% of the people who were reporting COVID-19 symptoms had lost their sense of smell. And that's huge because that hadn't really been documented. And so this way of making a more egalitarian accumulation of data. Who gets to report what's happening to them? Who gets to report where the disease is hitting, how severe it is, or who gets to report where climate change is affecting your daily life, your safety, the pollution, whatever it is around you that is happening because of climate change. So this way of telling personal narratives based on your local experience is a way to create a more equitable sharing of information of how the world is actually being affected. And it's also in a way more accurate. So like that, both the qualitative and quantitative data from people who aren't experts, it's still very useful for documenting, like our senses are instruments of measurement, like all measuring instruments extend our senses, but yeah. us as individuals saying this has happened and this has happened and, and if we, are able to make that that information available, that engagement available in terms of thinking about, talking about the real effects, then that creates in the end a much more accurate picture than even a model. The models are great, they're really accurate so far, but what does it mean on the ground and how is it manifesting because we're keeping to fairly mainstream sources sometimes we lose a lot of that accuracy and the granular detail that we need in order to really think this through together we wanted our brief workshop here with you to provide an introduction to recognizing and accessing embodied data that can bring your personal personal stories of climate change shorelines from places in the world that haven't been heard from or focused on, and also to empower the local stewardship of those shorelines. Um, and we thank you for participating in our workshop and coming here and participating in the whole conference. Thank you. Bye.